Hi everyone, this is Nish Dubashia. Uh, he's an independent scholar, writer, and integral thinker based in the UK. Uh, this is our second conversation. I'm going to link our first conversation in the description below in case you want to take a look at that one first. Uh, in this one, we are going to explore more about Kundalini uh, and non-duality. Welcome back, Nish. Thank you very much. It's uh, lovely to be back. Lovely to see you again. Same here, likewise. Uh, and I'm really um, interested in learning more about the circle model. Of um, I, I couldn't find a lot of information about it while I was researching. I was curious if it, if it, if this is something uh, you created, um, and what was the origin of this model? Yes, uh, yes, it is something that I created. And around about the same time um, that I created the diamond model, so it's, it's going back about 30 years. And what motivated me to try to create it is the traditions were talking, but they, they, they were using this common terminology, was coming up again and again, uh, gross, subtle, causal, uh, consciousness, emptiness, the witness consciousness, non-duality, conscious light. And I, I just wanted some clarity as to what exactly do these terms actually mean? Because it can be very confusing because you see all these terms being used all the time, but what do they really mean? And how do they really relate to each other? What's, what's the relationship between the gross and consciousness, for example? So that's what led me to create what I'm now calling the circle model, which is a very simple model, um, which essentially tries to show the relationship between consciousness and form. And within form, there are these different levels of being, realms of being, which we call gross, subtle and causal. Um, and I think if we see that model, it brings a lot of clarity to what could otherwise be a, quite a confusing array of terms that are just thrown about a lot in the spiritual world. So really it was just to bring clarity to these, this terminology and how these realms of being relate to one another. And that's what led to the circle model. Uh, can, can you describe it, um, Nish? What, what, does it, uh, what does it mean? What's the theory behind it? Sure. So I think um, what I'll do at this point is I will uh, share a screen. Sure. And then I can bring up a picture of the circle model, which I can then talk through. So can you see that OK? Yes. OK, so this is what is which what I've termed the circle model. It's it's. It looks very simple, but it's there's a lot there to unpack. So I'll give a quick overview of this model and what it's actually trying to say. So if we start, I think uh, uh, the easiest way to start would be to look at the right side of the model, which and the whole of that right side I've called form or light. So this is the realm of form. This is the realm of change. This is that aspect of reality where things are changing all the time. There's always transformation going on. There's always movement going on. There's, there's time. Time has meaning in this, in this, in this realm. Um, and some of the traditions talk about this realm or describe this realm as the realm of light. So everything that is in this realm of form is ultimately just different forms of light. Light is the basic substance that makes up this realm of form. Uh, that's definitely very strong in the tantric traditions of India. So I'll, I'll go through these three different realms and, and, and just give a quick overview of what I actually mean by these. So if we start at the bottom, I have there the gross, the gross realm. So the gross realm, this is basically the sensory motor world. This is everything that is accessible to our senses, what we can see or hear or smell, touch, taste, through our five senses. So this would include rocks and rivers and houses, uh, the physical body, and, and any physical object that you can sense. That entire realm, the material realm, that's the gross realm. And we have access to this realm when we're awake. 
that, that you know, 16 hours a day or whatever that we are in our waking state is the time when we have access to the gross realm in a way we don't when we're asleep. The, the gross realm disappears out of awareness when we're asleep. But when we're in our waking state, we have direct access to this gross realm. Now, moving up to a more subtle realm of reality and what it's actually called is the subtle realm. The subtle realm is our inner world. This is what's going on inside our personal consciousness, if you like. So this would include emotions, the mind, the higher mind, everything that you, you can't see it with your senses, but you can experience it within. That's the subtle realm. And we access the subtle realm when we're dreaming. So when we're asleep at night and we're dreaming, typically what we experience in our dream state are our emotions, mind, higher mind, perhaps. And we can also access this subtle realm even during the waking state using certain techniques such as meditation or shamanic voyaging. So even when we're awake, we can access images, emotions, thoughts, we can have visions. So we're then inhabiting both the gross realm with our senses and the subtle realm within us with our mind at the same time. If we if we want to do that, and most of the time we are doing that, we're simultaneously in the gross and the subtle. Now, if we move up to the causal, the causal is the realm which mystics differ. Sorry, excuse me, which mystics refer to as emptiness or formlessness, and this is where we have a blissful release, if you like from any gross or subtle forms. All of those come to an end and we are plunged into this state of formlessness, emptiness. Um, we can refer to that uh, as the ground of all being out of which everything comes out and back into which everything goes. And we access that causal state or causal realm when we're asleep at night and we're not dreaming. So this is accessed in deep, dreamless sleep. So every 24 hours, typically, we do a cycle of these three realms, awake, gross, dreaming, subtle, dreamless, causal. And they correspond to these three realms of being, the, the material world, the inner world, the, the ground of all being. So that entire cycle is referred to by some writers like Aurobindo, for example, uh, using terms like involution and evolution. So through a process of involution, the causal becomes the subtle, the subtle becomes the gross. And through a process of evolution, we can consciously return while we're awake to the subtle and to the causal. And mysticism, myst what we call mysticism, really is a way of accessing the subtle and the causal realms while we are still awake in the gross. That's really what mysticism is. However, some of the deeper traditions like Vedanta and uh, Buddhism and Taoism, Jainism, they suggest that in addition to this realm of form and light that's always changing, there is another realm which doesn't change. There is a changeless realm which lies in some sense, outside of or to the side of this realm of form and light. And that is referred to in the, the, the most, um, perhaps the, the best way of describing this is found in the Vedantic traditions, who refer to this as consciousness with a capital C. So this isn't just my personal consciousness that I have when I'm walking around doing things. This is a sense in a very deep part of me where I intersect with divine consciousness. And that part of me is referred to as the witness consciousness in, in the Hindu tradition. And that part of me, part of you, part of everybody is changeless. That never changes. So even when all this stuff is going on in the realm of form and light, gross, subtle, causal, there's a part of you that doesn't change. 
and that is consciousness or, or emptiness is another way of talking about that in some of the Buddhist traditions. Vedanta refers to this left-hand side of the circle model as Turiya, and Turiya means it's the fourth natural state. So we have our three natural states that we cycle through every 24 hours, the gross, the subtle, and the causal. But we have a fourth natural state, the Turiya, which is there all the time. It's ever present behind the scenes all the time. And that is our true self, our Turiya. And that is a pure observing awareness that's always observing and always aware of these three states. And we're, we're usually not conscious of this fourth state, but it's always there. And what the mystical traditions typically refer to as awakening is to become conscious of this fourth natural state, to become conscious of Turiya, which is our true self, our ever-present self, and in a sense, the divine consciousness as it is within each one of us. Now, a lot of traditions stop there and say that that emptiness consciousness is the ultimate truth. Um, and they may typically say that the right hand is lesser or even that the right hand is an illusion. But there is an even higher state where the difference between the left hand, which is the consciousness, and the right hand, which is form and light, even the very distinction or rather the, the dualism between these two aspects of reality that dualism is dissolved and we move into a final radical non-dualism which i've called their conscious light which is a term i'm borrowing from the kashmir shaivist tradition from north india and in conscious light consciousness and light or consciousness and form are seen to be ultimately just two aspects, if you like the subjective and the objective aspects of the one fundamental substance or condition out of which everything is made. And that is referred to in the Hindu tradition in Vedanta, in some of the very high Vedantic traditions as Turiya Tita. So emptiness and consciousness was Turiya, which is the fourth state. Turiya Tita means beyond the fourth. So we're going even beyond the fourth state now into conscious light, which is the Turiya Tita. And it is this conscious light that we can truly refer to as the non-dual. That's the real non-dualism. That's also ever present. It's unqualifiable. We can't talk about it without invoking paradox, as we went into in some detail last time. And that is really what we could call spirit. So that's the true ultimate reality which um, we can call spirit. So that's a quick overview of this circle model, which very roughly covers the different dimensions of reality that the, diff the different mystical traditions talk about. It seems like, uh, and, and I'm speaking more from what's usually suggested from a modern non-duality perspective, Mm -hmm. um, it seems like when that kind of opening happens, it's not necessary that all these other states that you have mentioned, causal, subtle, gross, um, they are opened up. Like that kind of opening can happen even without be this being opened up. Uh, yes, so I, I agree. That is true. Yes, it is because consciousness on the left is ever present. It's always there. We don't need to have necessarily fully realized or fully exhausted every possibility on the right side first in order to have some kind of experience of the left side. So a lot of people have temporary state experiences of this consciousness or witness consciousness, even though they may not have experienced subtle or causal very much at all. I, I'm uh, curious, sorry, go ahead. Um, when we come to examine Kundalini, what I'll be suggesting, though, is that for this consciousness experience to become really permanent and grounded in its highest potential, it can, though, possibly help to have explored the whole of form. 
but it's certainly not necessary. And in most cases, um, that's not the case. Most realizers of consciousness don't necessarily speak about having realized subtle and causal first. Yeah. And the reason is because consciousness is ever present. So it's always accessible no matter what we're doing. I'm curious, like even after realizing one's true nature and even after realizing consciousness, why is it that it takes, sometimes it could take a very long time to these states to open up. So I'm, I'm curious about the reason, like why that is so much more, um, it seems like it's a lot more involved then because the realization part sometimes it can be just a click it can happen mm -hmm. um very spontaneously whereas this um seems to be quite gradual to stabilize yeah i think that's that's exactly right i think the reason for that is because the consciousness on the left is not something new that we need to create it's not something that's not already there. All we need to do really is plug into something that actually is already part of us. That's why it can happen as a sudden realization, as a satori, what they call in Zen Buddhism, um, because we're not, we don't have to evolve in order to realize consciousness because it lies outside of time and it's ever present and it's something we already have. In order to realize on the, on the, on, in the form light side of the equation, in order to truly realize the subtle and the causal is much more difficult in some sense because we're having to evolve and create ways of perceiving that we don't already have. We're, we're having to create some new forms of perception and cognition in us. And that can take a lot of time, decades or lifetimes that can take, because you're literally transforming your body mind into something radically new. To realize consciousness, you don't have to transform to something radically new. You just need to realize something that's already there. And that's why I think it's in some sense easier to click into that, whereas it's much more difficult to develop into subtle and causal realms um, more fully on the right side. I have some more questions around that topic, Nish, but I'll first let you explain um, uh, about Kundalini and then we can dive deeper into some of these questions. Yeah, certainly, yes. So what I'll do then is um, I'll bring up a, a, a screen which talks about or shows the Kundalini structure in the body. Now, what, what we need to do is just to bear in mind that this circle model is a model of reality as a whole it's the macrocosm of reality but it's also uh, a model of the microcosm of the human body so the human body it, its esoteric structure is also exactly what we see here in the circle model so that the body is the universe a, a tiny version of the universe it's a microcosm of the macrocosm so bearing that in mind what i will do is bring up this model, which is the model of the Kundalini structure in the human body. And I will quickly run through this. So if you look at the dotted line there, almost just, just left of the middle, that's the divide between consciousness and form in our circle model. So to the left of that dotted line, we've got consciousness. And to the right of that dotted line, we've got form and light. So if you, in, if you look at the esoteric anatomy within the human body, which we typically call the Kundalini, we have a vertical dimension, which is what we typically know from the root up to the crown. Those are your chakras in the Kundalini, and they are the aspects of the human body in the subtle part of the human body that take you on this journey through gross to subtle to causal within the realm of form. We, now, if you look, we also have a horizontal line there as well. And if we start from the right, what we'll see is we have three types of heart as well. And this is far less known. So on the, on the right side, we have the physical heart, which is the gross heart, which pumps blood. That's our actual physical heart. 
In the middle, we have the subtle heart, which is part of our Kundalini rising chakras. And on the very left, we have the causal heart, which I'll come to later. And that causal heart is that part of us that gives us access to the consciousness side of the equation. So we can see here, I hope, how the human body actually correlates in some sense with the circle model. Yep. So I'll run through the chakras very quickly. So the chakras are basically energy centers. And these correspond, each of these energy centers correspond to different aspects of our physical and emotional life. So I'll run through all seven of these very quickly. So the root chakra, that corresponds to sort of our basic needs, our basic security, our survival. Going up one, the sacral chakra, that's to do with our self-worth, our self uh, our, our sense of self, our pleasure, our sexuality, our creativity, that all comes from the sacral. Moving up to the solar plexus, that's where we get a strong sense of self, self-esteem, self-confidence. So, so far we're kind of still in the gross realm here. This is all relatively gross stuff. Now, as we start moving from solar plexus into the heart, we're moving from gross into subtle. So the heart chakra, which is in the middle of the body, the middle of the torso, if you like, or the middle of the spine, that is to do with love, that is to do with our connection to others. Then as we move into the throat chakra, that is to do with truth and communication. So heart, throat chakra, we're still kind of in the subtle realm here. And as we move into the third eye, where which is the sixth chakra, the Ajna chakra, we're moving into, if you like, the threshold to the causal. So in the third eye, that's where we have our intuition and that's where we start to see the big picture. And then we move to the final chakra at the top of the head, which is the Sahasra, and that's the crown chakra. And that is to do with our life's purpose, spirituality, enlightenment. And that crown chakra corresponds to what we called earlier the causal. So if we're plunged into the crown chakra, that is in Hinduism what we call nirvikalpa samadhi, uh, which is um, a temporary absorption in the causal realm. Now all of this is happening in the realm of form and light still. So this is why the kundalini shakti, that energy, can go up and down these chakras in in a process of time. We're not in the timeless consciousness here. This is still in the realm of form and light. Now I'll look at the three hearts. So if we start with the physical heart, now this is actually on the right side of the physical diagram, but actually in our body, it's on the left side. So think of this as you're looking at somebody's body. So it's gonna be reflected. So the physical heart gross, which is the right side of the diagram, but the left side of the body, that is actually the physical organ which pump, pumps blood through our different arteries and veins, and that's what keeps us alive. The middle heart, that's the subtle heart, which is, as we discussed before, love, connection to others. And we also have this causal heart, which is called the Hridayam or the Hridaya Granti, and that is on the right side of the heart. And that is where the center of consciousness is located in the human body. So when we talk about the witness consciousness, now we're going outside of form into that timeless state of consciousness. Now, now obviously the consciousness doesn't have a physical form, but for consciousness to actually interact with the physical world, there is a correlate of consciousness in the human body, which is the right side of the heart, uh, the Hridaya Granthi, and that is where, in the Hindu tradition, they say the Atman, the, your, your true self, is located, or at least it's through that right side, causal heart, that you can discover your Atman, which is the same as Brahman, the divine reality. This right side of the heart, it's spoken of in some of the ancient Hindu scriptures, like the Yoga Vasishta, the Sita Upanishad, and it was made popular again, in, or well known again in modern times, with teachers such as Ramana Maharshi, Adida, and some Ayurvedic texts talk about this as well. 
that causal heart is where the true self or the real I is located. And the traditions, the, the yogic traditions that go this far, what they say is that your I thought, your thought of being a separate self, and actually any thoughts at all arise out of this right side of the heart, and they move up to the crown chakra, which is where we start to experience them within the realm of form. And in most people, this causal heart is actually a knot. It's not open, it's, it's closed. And that's, that knot, I mean, granti means knot, and that knot is the seat of ignorance, that the fundamental root of our ignorance that keeps us from enlightenment is this closure of this causal heart um, in, in the realm of consciousness, or at least where form and consciousness interact. When we achieve realization of consciousness, not just a glimpse, but true permanent realization of consciousness, that causal heart opens. And through that opening, the divine, speaking metaphorically, the divine can come through into the human body and into human consciousness. So looking at this whole picture now, what we have here is that the Shakti, which is the, the energy which lies at the root of the whole of reality, that energy passes up what we call our Sushumna, which is that central channel where these different chakras reside. And as that Shakti moves from root to sacral all the way up to crown, and in some rare cases down into the cause of heart, what it's actually doing is it's destroying our vasanas, it's destroying those tendencies that we have that keep us locked in ignorance, that keep us exclusively identified with the human body, which therefore prevents us from realizing enlightenment. So that's in a way the circle model applied to the human body. And what you can see there is, a, is how the human body is a microcosm of the whole of reality. And that's what these chakras and kundalini pictures show us, is that how the human body, each one of us in our body, we're really a small universe. And so we can realize enlightenment through the body, because through the body, we have access to the whole of reality. That's, that's the tantric vision. Uh, and can you explain the, uh, what's the role of Kundalini um, in, in this? Yes. So what I will do, I'll show you another, I'll move to another screen here where I've talked about how um, the Kundalini as a, as a form of energy moves around these different chakras and how each different movement of Kundalini with, around this esoteric anatomy corresponds to different types of realization that we can see in the spiritual traditions. So here's another diagram. So I'm going back to the circle model here, but this is effectively now, think of this now as the human body rather than reality. So, this is the human body. We've got the gross subtle causal, which is our Kundalini line. We've got emptiness and consciousness there on the left, which is our causal heart. Uh, so this is the human body as a microcosm of the circle of the whole of reality. And the Kundalini energy is an energy that can flow around these different parts of the circle the different parts of the human body in different ways and these different ways that it moves around the circle around the human body signifies different types of realization that we see written about in the traditions now when i'm going through this i'm drawing on various sources i'm 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 drawing on esoteric taoism which talks about this i'm drawing here a, a lot on the teachings of Ramana Maharshi, the teachings of Adida, and on some of the tantric traditions. So um, if you look there at arrow number one, 
Now in arrow number one, what we have is the, the, the Shakti or the energy or the divine energy moving down the chakras from causal down to subtle, down to gross. Now this is the realm of what we can call bhakti or the realm of devotion and mystics who exemplified this kind of realization. A couple of examples would be Ramakrishna, the great Bengali mystic, or in the Christian tradition, say Saint Seraphim of Saroth. Now these are mystics who lived a life of devotion to the ultimate reality and to the source. So in this life of devotion, one is situated still in the gross. So one doesn't actually move beyond the gross but one enters into a relationship with the divine, which is the subtle and the causal. And through that relationship with the divine, through bhakti, energy can flow down from the causal, down to the subtle, down to the gross. So what we see here in arrow number one is a descent of spirit. So spirit is at causal. I live a life of devotion to causal. So that could be devotion to Vishnu, Shiva, the goddess, Jesus. That represents the causal. And that spiritual energy is sent down to me from causal down to subtle, down to gross. In the Christian tradition, that's referred to as the baptism of the Holy Spirit, for example. Um, in Taoism, one, it talks about how this energy, this arrow number one, can be experienced as a kundalini shakti. They, they don't use that term, but that's what they're talking about. Coming down the front of the body, starting at the top of the head and coming down the front of the body, down to the bottom of the body. So this is, if you like, the shakti coming, the kundalini shakti coming down. Um, and this is a descent typically down the front of the body. So one is still situated in the gross realm, and one experiences the kundalini as coming down towards one. One doesn't go up, but God, God comes down to you. Now, somebody who is a master of this type of shakti is typically called a saint. This is what we call a saint. When we refer to somebody as a saint, this is somebody who has mastered arrow number one. They've mastered the descent of this shakti causal to subtle to gross, which they interpret as, well, this is the grace of God. This is the mercy, the blessing, the grace of God is coming down to me. But this isn't non-dualism yet, because there is still a very strong dualism here, which is there is a dualism between God and the self. God and the self are still different here, which is why I need God to send his blessings down to me, because we're different. So this isn't the end of the journey because there's still this dualism between God and the other, uh, sorry, self and the other, which is God. So that's the first type of Kundalini or Shakti experience that we see in the traditions. Now, the second type is the most well-known. And this is what most people mean when they talk about Kundalini. And this is where, in a way, we do the reverse of arrow one. Now, this is arrow number two. And here we start at the gross, and we move to the subtle and we move into the causal realm. So if I just go back quickly to the um, previous slide, this is where, so in, in our first arrow number one with devotion, in effect, the Shakti was coming down the front of the body from the location of crown, third eye, throat, down to the root. In the ascending schools, which is the most well-known school of Kundalini, Kundalini rises from the bottom to the top. So we have here the Kundalini power is awakened at the root and that Shakti awakens through sacral solar plexus, heart, throat, third eye, and culminates in the crown chakra. And we can think of this as a mystical ascent through the chakras, culminating at the end with an absorption in the crown chakra. And that absorption we can call nirvikalpa samadhi, or in Buddhism we can call niroda, it's an absorption in emptiness. 
And it's an absorption of our self-consciousness that our sense of self disappears temporarily and we are absorbed in the Sahasra, which is the crown chakra, which we could see as the ground of all being or God out of which everything comes and back into which everything goes. Examples of great realizers who have um, emphasized or realized this arrow number two, uh, Nityananda, Muktananda, that's the uh, school of the Siddha Yoga, which we have in India, and also Aurobindo. Aurobindo would have emphasized through this process of evolution, this arrow number two back here, where we're going from gross to subtle to causal. That causal, we have what Aurobindo might refer to there as the supermind. That's the end of the evolutionary process. Now, people who are adepts at this kind of ascending yoga, we call yogis. When we use the word yogi, that's typically somebody who's engaged in arrow number two here. So arrow number one coming down is the saint. Arrow number two going up is the yogi. Now, again, this isn't non-dualism because even when one is absorbed in the causal, there's still a dualism here between the causal and its manifestation. The causal is the ground of all being. The subtle and gross are the manifestations of the causal, and they are never fully united here. You're, you're either one or the other. You're either absorbed or you're awake. So we still have this dualism here between the ground and its manifestation. And in the Hindu tradition, they say that you can at most be absorbed in that causal realm for 21 days before you die. The body will need to return to the subtle and the gross again to be able to resume its normal functioning. So this isn't yet perfect awakening. Although yogis will talk about it like that, it's still not non-dualism because you still have this dualism between ground and manifestation. This is also the realm where we, yogis explore all kinds of interesting things in the subtle realm. So lights and sounds and deities. So this is your subtle mysticism. So one and two, arrows one and two kind of go together because together they form a circle. Arrow number one is the energy coming down the front of the body, which is the devotional practice of the saint. And then that energy goes down the bottom of the body and comes back up the front, the back of the body again, back up to the crown chakra at the top of the head. Now, you can think of that as forming a circle, if you like. The arrow number one is the outer arc, and the arrow number two is the inner arc, and that forms a circle. And that circle is in the body, the microcosmic representation of involution and evolution, creation and destruction. That process of creation and destruction that's going on all the time in the universe is mapped onto our body as this kundalini going down and the kundalini coming up. In the Taoist tradition, which is actually very strong on this circle, they call this the microcosmic orbit, which is a representation in the body of the macrocosmic orbit of the whole universe. So the whole universe re is representing itself in our body here as down and up, down and up. Um, so that's, we've covered their arrows one and two, and that those are the most common forms of Kundalini Shakti experience. Now, arrow number three. What's happening here at arrow number three is we reach the causal here at the top of form. And then there is a fall out of the realm of time, which is form and light on the right, into the realm of timeless, which is emptiness consciousness there on the left. And once again, if I go back to the previous slide, what's happening here is the Kundalini Shakti has risen now from the root all the way up to the crown. And then in some very rare cases, this is a very rare realization, it continues its journey and it falls from the crown into the right side of the heart, into that causal heart area, which is the Hridaya Granthi. And the most well-known teacher who spoke about this in recent history was Ramana Maharshi, who spoke about this a lot. 
And in his lineage, you see this in people like Lakshmana Swami, Saradama, and also Adida talks about this quite a lot. And so let me unpack a little bit what's happening here. When the Kundalini Shakti is going down from crown to root and up from root to crown, so we have that circle I spoke about, our sense of identity is still the separate self in the realm of form. But when the Kundalini Shakti falls from the crown into the right side of the heart, there is a shift of identity and the separate self, Suma or Nishad, the separate self dies and we awaken to the true self, which is located, metaphorically located, in the right side of the heart. That's the witness consciousness. And when we move to that witness consciousness, that is what in Buddhism we call Nirvana. We've realized what the Buddha calls the unborn. So arrow number three is a movement from birth and death, that circle of one and two, which goes round and round. That's the circle of reincarnation. That's the circle of birth and death. To be truly liberated, we need to come out of that circle of birth and death into that which is beyond birth and death, that which is unborn. And that's what arrow number three does. We move from the crown chakra at the causal into the Hridaya Granthi at consciousness. And we then situate ourselves in the witness consciousness, which is the timeless unborn state. And when we are permanently situated in that state, the experience of that is to be completely detached from whatever is happening. So from that witness consciousness place to the right side of the heart, which is the left side of this diagram, we're able to watch everything that's happening in form as if we're watching a movie. It's not really happening to us. What's happening in the world is just a film and we're just the projector, we're just watching it. We're not involved with it because we've gone beyond it. This is the timeless state of consciousness which corresponds to the right side of the heart there. Now, most traditions actually speak about this as being final enlightenment or final liberation. And why it's not is because we still have a very subtle dualism here, which is the dualism between consciousness and form. Even though we're liberated from form into consciousness, we still have one final, very subtle, dualism remaining, which is the witness versus that which we're witnessing. So we've still got this final trace dualism remaining between consciousness and form, which is signified by that line down the middle of the circle. That is still there even when we've fallen into the heart on that right side of the body. Now, Arrow one, people who are masters of arrow one, we, we call them saints. People who are masters of arrow two, we call them yogis. Now, people who master arrow three, we call them sages. A sage is somebody who has fallen into the right side of the heart and who has realized the unborn, who has realized consciousness. So in the literature of mysticism, almost everybody is referred to by one of these three terms. Somebody, they're either a saint or a yogi or a sage. And if we want to use these terms very precisely, the Kundalini Shakti gives us a clue as to how to do that. When the Kundalini is descending, that's the saint. When it's ascending, that's the yogi. When it's moving to the right side of the heart, that's the sage. <laughs> now, there are still two more movements that the Kundalini can make, and, and we're getting into very rare territory now. Very few people have reported this kind of realization. When we've realized emptiness or consciousness as a result of Kundalini movement three, there's still that very subtle dualism left between consciousness and form. The next thing the Kundalini Shakti wants to do if you like, putting it that way, is it wants to resolve that dualism. So it wants to now return, having realized consciousness on the left, it wants to now return back to the realm of form and unite left and right. 
So going back to the previous slide here, we've gone up, we've gone up from root to crown, we've fallen down into the causal heart, and now we want to realize true final non-duality. And the only way to do that is for the Kundalini Shakti, having realized consciousness, to go back to form and unite consciousness and form in one final union between consciousness and form. Now, this um, movement of the Kundalini Shakti from crown down to the causal heart, which I called arrow number three, and from the causal heart back to the crown, which is the real enlightenment, the real non-dualism, that movement of the Kundalini Shakti is called the Amrita Nadi, which is the channel of nectar or the channel of bliss. This is where that ultimate bliss comes from. Um, and this is the final channel, if you like, of the, the journey of the Kundalini Shakti. So what happens with arrow number four is that having realized consciousness there, the consciousness of the sage, the Kundalini Shakti now wants to resolve this final dualism and it returns from consciousness back to the causal. And thereby, because all of form is inherent in causal, by uniting consciousness with causal, you've united consciousness with form and you've achieved that final non-duality, which is the conscious light. And that is also the second movement of the Amrita Nadi. And people who realize this typically are called the Siddha or the Mahasiddha. In the south of India, there's a huge Mahasiddha tradition. And typically, the highest of these Mahasiddhas talk about this final realization where consciousness and form and light have this final union. So the sage still felt this difference between consciousness and form or between the transcendent self and the phenomenal world. So probably the best tradition of the sage is um, the Vedanta. So Vedanta will look at form and say that's Maya, that's illusion. But the Siddha won't do that. The Siddha will actually return to form via this Amrita Nadi, which is the arrow number four. And by doing that, the self doesn't remain in the heart, in the causal heart alone. It now returns and finds a link between both the causal heart on the, on the right of the body and the causal chakra on the top of the head. Those two points, which are consciousness and light, are united. And once that is achieved, then form and light is no longer seen as separate from consciousness because the Amrita Nadi has now united the two. And typically now, form, instead of being seen as di different from consciousness, form is now seen as the radiance of consciousness. So I'll explain what I think that means. If you think of the sun in the sky, and then you think of the, the, the sunshine, what's the relationship between the sun and the sunshine? Well, they're not exactly the same. But they're not different either. The sunshine is actually just the shining or the radiance of the sun. So in the same way that sunshine is the radiance of the sun, to a Siddha who has realized this fourth movement of the Kundalini, form and light, which is gross subtle causal, the whole of the world is seen as the radiance of consciousness. It's seen as the sunshine of consciousness. So when consciousness, divine consciousness shines, that shine is the world in which we're living. And that's the final non-dual realization. Um, and that's in, in Hinduism, that's called Sahaja Samadhi. Once that's been realized, the adept or the Siddha or the Mahasiddha can just walk around and live his normal life. But now everything that he perceives and experiences is seen to be just a form of consciousness. It's not, form is not different from consciousness anymore. Form is consciousness. And everything that arises now is just a form of that divine consciousness. Um, so yeah, I think that's, that's non-dualism, which is the, the, the real non-dualism, which is this arrow number four, which is the Amrita Nadi. Now, 
there's even one further, one further movement here. And this is where some of the really high traditions in the tantric traditions, the Tibetan Buddhism traditions, and the Taoist traditions, they talk about post-enlightenment stages. There are even stages that exist after enlightenment. And that is arrow number five. So what then happens is the Amrita Nadi has brought the Kundalini Shakti back from the right side of the heart back to the causal. And now this fully enlightened Shakti, if you like, now descends again from the causal into the subtle, into the gross. So you now have enlightenment coming down and enlightening and divinizing the world. And people who realize this arrow number five are typically called the avatar, which is the highest realization you can have. So typical avatars would be, say, Padmasambhava, Milarepa from the Tibetan tradition, the Buddha in Buddhism, Krishna in Hinduism, Jesus, perhaps in Christianity. So these are people who've realized the highest realization, which we're signifying there by four, the Amrita Nadi, but they don't just remain in the non-dual, they now return with that non-dual realized Shakti from the crown chakra down to subtle and gross. And when they bring that realized Shakti down through subtle and gross, they transform subtle and gross. This is what um, Aurobindo refers to as the supramental transformation. We now actually, we don't just see the body as a form of consciousness, but divine consciousness now falls into the body and transforms the body into, um, into divinity itself. Uh, this is uh, the divinization of the body and the divinization of the world. In um, Buddhism, the best known example of this would be the rainbow body, where in Tibetan Buddhism, the most highly realized sages, the claim, the claim is that when they die, the, the body literally just starts to change into light and disappears. Um, that's an idea that was borrowed by George Lucas in the Star Wars movies. When Yoda, dis when Yoda dies in the Star Wars movie, he disappears into light. That's actually borrowed from this Tibetan and Taoist idea that when this arrow number five is realized, the body is not only recognized as conscious light, but actually starts to change and transform into conscious light. And there are actually scholars who believe that this is what happened to Jesus. When you talk about the resurrection of Jesus, this could actually be an example of this arrow number five, where the body was transformed into light. So to summarize, I'll quickly go back to this esoteric anatomy. To summarize, the Kundalini Shakti has five basic movements. Initially, crown, down the front of the body, crown all the way down to root. That is the saint, the devotional. The second movement, root up to crown. That is the yogi, um, the ascending master. Movement number three, we have crown down to the causal heart. That is the sage. That's what you have in Vedanta, the realization of consciousness, the Amrita Nadi. Then we have arrow number four, where the causal heart comes back to the crown. That is the regeneration of the Amrita Nadi, as Adidar calls it. And that is the, the realization of non-dualism between consciousness and form. And that is the realm of the Siddha or the Mahasiddha. And then finally, that non-dual realization comes down into all the chakras again and divinizes the entire body mind. And that is the realm of the avatar. And that is where the world and the body is actually transformed or translated into divine light. And you see that in the rainbow bodies of Taoism and Tibetan Buddhism. And in South India, in the Siddha tradition, in some of the South Indian uh, states, there are records of this as well taking place. So that's a, a quick overview of um, how the Kundalini Shakti can move around 
doing all these amazing things in the body and how that corresponds to different aspects of the great tradition of spirituality. That gives a lot of clarity, Nish. Thank you so much for that explanation. It, it surely um, opens up a lot of questions. Uh, and also, uh, but at the same time, it also, sometimes it's helpful to understand these things, even for theoretical sake, because sometimes if you are going through these experiences on your own, um, it can be a bit confusing. Mm, mm, yes. Um, so it's, it's it does help to understand a bigger picture. I I wanted to ask you a couple of questions around um, the nuances involved in in journey of some of these steps or moments that you just described. For example, sure. one of and this is just an observation. Please correct me if you're if I'm wrong. Uh, I'm open to suggestions. Um, one of the things I've noticed is like. So with self-realization, it seems like um, they, there's a realization that a lot of these things, concepts or programs are getting generated by the mind. And there's a seeing of that, but that doesn't mean those programs are um, like dissolved. Like those programs could still continue running even after self-realization. And it seems like some of these things you pointed out on the right-hand side with gross to subtle and causal in that journey, it seems like there is that potential to dissolve those programs a mm -hmm. lot more deeply, especially in subtle realms. Like it, uh, it shows some of the things that is there even at your subconscious level. Uh, so there's potential to dissolve some of that in while you're exploring those um, different layers, and that doesn't get pointed out in self-realization like it, it's it gets seen is like that is it like that's your destination and you're done but what are your thoughts on that like uh, when some of these things open up in the subtle realm um what do you think is the uh, do dreams play a role in those kind of in that process in that journey Yes, I, I think so. Yes, I believe so. If we're talking here about arrow number two, which is that ascent from gross to subtle to causal, mm -hmm. that process of ascent is a process of purification. Yoga, the yogi is interested in purifying his vehicles, his gross, subtle and causal vehicles. And the subtle realm is the realm of the dreams. And dreams can tell you a lot about what remaining programs or vasanas or karmas you still have left. A fully realized yogi who has truly opened up the entirety of form and light will have purified all of that, ideally to such an extent that there are no longer any dreams because there's nothing left to resolve. So um, that process of purification is arrow number two, which is um, the ascent from gross to subtle to causal. When teachers of consciousness talk about realizing consciousness beyond the realm of form and light, it is possible to have some kind of experience of that or some kind of glimpse of that without having done that purification work on the right. So this is why the realization of consciousness, which is the sage, is different from the realization of the of the ascending mysticism, which is the yogi. You don't, strictly speaking, need to be a yogi in order to be a sage. You can fall into this ever-present consciousness without having purified the subtle and causal vehicles. If, however, your realization of consciousness is true and deep and permanent, then I think what tends to happen is that purification may actually take place post-realization, um, just as a matter of course. Because I think, because you've disidentified now from form and light, form and light is now given far greater freedom to purify itself because you're no longer 
contaminating it, if you like, with your own self-contraction. Your sense of self has moved to a different place. And this is why I think some teachers talk about a post-realization process where um, even after they've realized consciousness, you know, it takes another seven years, another 10 years to burn up their calms. Because even though they're now situated there in consciousness, it's still taking time for this gross and subtle to purify itself. And I, I feel like purification is not the only reason for dreams. I feel like dreams mm -hmm. can much more like, they, they can be a good learning tools also mm -hmm. to um, mm -hmm. open up to new newer concepts, which was not even in the imagination before. Yes, definitely. Um, so that, that would relate, if you like, to arrow number one on the diagram. So if you're talking about the ascending mysticism of arrow number two, then we're talking about dreams acting as a purification vessel. But with, in the context of arrow number one, where causal is becoming subtle, is becoming gross, then dreams can act as a vehicle to receive higher information that's coming down. So one, arrow one is the arrow of learning, if you like, because we're channeling new information that's coming from above. Whereas arrow number two is the arrow of purification, where we're purifying obstacles to realization. And both of those are necessary and important to complete this circle that takes place in the realm of form. So dreams play a dual role, but learning and also purification. And one more thing I wanted to ask was, especially because this doesn't get pointed out um, in most of the talks where because we have a tendency to see some of these things as pure and sacred, but sometimes I feel like in these, these explorations can also entail um, some traps mm. uh, and th that doesn't get talked about enough. Um, and, and that's also kind of like a learning process because um, once you understand, um, get a bigger picture, um, those traps may not, may, uh, you may not fall for those traps anymore. Mm -hmm. But I, I'm just, uh, I was just curious from your perspective, like what function does it serve? Like sometimes some of these random dreams can happen, which doesn't have any like uh, use utility, but it's just like kind of like to, it, it seems as though they, those dreams are giving right information, but at the end they, kind of just turned out to be useless. Um, so mm -hmm. those kind of learnings, um, I'm, I'm just curious, is it by design or is it um, like in that realm, there is so much to explore that all these uh, different possibilities open up in that realm? What, what is your understanding about um, exploring the, uh, the subtle realm? Yeah, I think it's very difficult to interpret the subtle realm. So I would say that some kind of a dream experience, if we're, you know, if we wake up in the morning and we want to, we're remembering a vivid dream, it can be very difficult to know exactly what purpose that dream is fulfilling. Uh, that dream could be giving us information that we need for our own growth. It could be clearing out stuff from our past that we need to remember and clear out. And, and that could include past lives, if you want to believe in that, uh, that needs to be cleared out on our journey. It could actually also just be something we can't make sense of. It could be just random, or it could be something that has some meaning, but we don't have the necessary apparatus to perceive that meaning yet as well. So we, we do have to be a little careful because it's possible to read into dreams things that might be not really not really the point of the dream. Um, but I think that whole process of engaging with dreams in a very conscious way um, is certainly part of that ascending process. If we're interested in engaging in this ascending process, gross to subtle to causal, 
than working with dreams and just trying to disentangle what's going on here. Information, purification, random. We just don't know. It's, it's just a way of opening ourselves up to a realm that's usually unconscious. That's how I, I see it. It's more of more than necessarily just getting information every time. It's more a way of opening up our being to bigger and newer and deeper possibilities. I think that's what dream work can do. And what I also find is that in due course, we will learn to lucid dream. So we will remain awake within the dream. So even while the dream is going on, we're able to watch it. We're able to know that we're dreaming. And so we become real awakened or awake explorers of the subtle realm through, through, dream, through dream work. Is there a connection between dream realm uh, and collective unconscious? It's, yeah, I mean, I think the dream, the dream world takes you closer to the collective unconscious than your waking state. So if we look at this circle model on the right, we can see there the, if we look at the subtle realm as the, the realm of the dream state, we can think of the collective unconscious as belonging more to the causal realm rather than the subtle realm. So the dream state, as we go deeper and deeper from sort of, I mean, there are subcategories here, which I haven't made clear because it's too detailed for this model, but there is a low subtle, a high subtle, a low causal, a high causal. As we move deeper into the dream state, so a very personal dream, so me remembering something that happened 20 years ago, that would be a very personal dream that may have nothing to do with the collective unconscious. So we can think of that as the low subtle state. But as we move beyond the personal to start to dream and access material that may be going beyond just my own personal experience, we could think of that as the high subtle. And that's when we're starting to experience archetypes. And once we start to experience archetypes in the high subtle, that's when we're starting to plug into this collective unconscious that we can call the low causal. So the collective unconscious in this journey would be high, subtle, low causal. But that would need a lot of dream work to really start to go beyond just our own personal material. We may need to work through our personal material first and then start to plug into more transpersonal archetypes that are then doorways to this, what, what in Buddhism they call the alaya Vijnana, which is the storehouse consciousness, which stores ex all the experiences that everybody has ever had. And that is stored in the low causal. And that, that, that access to archetypes in dream work, deep dream work, may give us access to that collective unconscious. And that kind of makes sense that it may open up more after self-realization because that tendency of attaching meaning or judging something, uh, if it's not loosened up, um, it can become quite more, uh, like some of these realms can be challenging to uh, tackle if that is not taken care of. Um, yes, yes, most certainly, yes. I mean, it, it, it can work both ways around. We can go through this process of ascent in order to later realize consciousness. Yes. Or we can realize consciousness first and then come back and deal with this stuff in form later. And actually it's easier that way around because we've disidentified from form, which makes it a lot easier to deal with our stuff because we're not so involved with it anymore. Yeah, otherwise it can become quite like entangled and- Exactly. Angry. So exactly. So we, we get out of it first, if you like, and yeah. then come back to deal with it. And it's a lot easier because we're not, like you said, we're not entangled with it anymore. We've already achieved that detachment from it. Yeah, um, I, I can see like uh, otherwise how for in some cases it, it can become difficult to manage the gross realm versus physical realm versus the subtle realms. Um, um, and like being able to keep it light without having 
without that having interfering with your regular life uh, i think uh, yes 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 that becomes a lot easier if it opens up gradually after self realization yes most certainly yes and that is the experience of many realizers they they find they can go back and do their personal and collective stuff a lot easier because they've they've gone beyond attachment to outcomes uh, can you share your uh, kundalini experience how that um, and how that comes together in this context that we are talking about in the circle yeah now? certainly so i started my exploration of the spiritual mystical domain when i was a university student around about the age of 18 19 and initially my main teacher was krishnamurti judu krishnamurti and he his teachings were had some similarities with advaita so there's no practice there's no time realization is sudden and i practiced but i mean there's no practice to do but i i engaged with this teaching for about six years quite seriously um and there were some insights i had during this time and when I was 24, I traveled to Switzerland to meet, there's another Krishnamurti called UG Krishnamurti, who was teaching an even more radical version of what J Krishnamurti was teaching. And I spent some time with UG, staying with UG in, in Switzerland, in Gestad, in Switzerland. And the last time I met him, as I um, left, Yes, sorry, shall I just close down the screen? Or have you done that? Uh, can you still you, see this? Can you still see the screen? Sorry. Let me close down the screen because I can, um, we can talk face to face. Now. Do you want to share the screen? No, no, let's do it. Okay, great. Okay. So, Shall I carry on? Oh, just a second. I just want to make sure it's. Yeah, I can't I, see. The make... Sorry, uh, sorry. Go ahead. I, I can't see the screen now. Can you see the screen? Yes, I wanted to make sure it's continuing to record. Um... Oh, okay. So, um, I when I went to see UG, um, as I left him that last time, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't see him again. I was on a train coming back from Gestad back to Interlaken where I was staying. This is 1990, I'm 24 years old. Um, and I started to have a strange experience. I started to see some kind of spiritual teacher in my mind's eye. <laughs> Somebody I'd never seen, never heard of. And I could just very clearly see this picture of this person. Um, and I had no idea who he was. and when I went back to London, I walked into Watkins Bookshop one day, which is the main bookshop in London for this kind of subject. And I saw a book and the, the, there was a picture on the front cover of this book, which was exactly this teacher that I had been seeing in, in my mind's eye on this train in Switzerland, which took me, you know, it was quite shocking to see that. So obviously I bought the book. And I went round and bought lots of other books that I could find on written by this author. And I started, and this was a teacher of Kundalini yoga, type of Kundalini yoga. And I started to expose myself to this side of the equation, the form light side of the equation. And I started to see then why I was already starting to get a bit frustrated with the more Advaita approach. Because apart from attending lectures and reading and listening to talks by Krishnamurti and other teachers of that type, there didn't seem to be anything else I could do. When I discovered this teacher, there was a, 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 a clear practice that I could do and a clear model of how realization could actually be truly embodied in the body and the mind. So it's no longer just an intellectual thing, it's a real thing that one can really experience in one's own being. So I took up the practice of Kundalini Yoga after this strange introduction to this teacher. And I carried on that practice for about six years. So this practice consisted of meditation and 
devotion to the teacher, study of the scriptures, uh, use of mantras, use of yantras, hatha yoga, pranayama, breathing exercises. And I was doing this really seriously, like two or three hours a day. Um, and six years later, when I was 30, um, I was, I had what I now regard as my first true Kundalini experience. And I was basically lying on my bed at home about six o'clock, seven o'clock in the evening, doing some of these practices. And it felt like this hole was being opened in the top of the head. It literally felt like some kind of opening was happening in the top of the, the head area, the top of the skull. And some kind of energy of some kind, which was felt like this fiery tingle, that's the only way I can explain it really, started to come down the front of the body. And it was a very slow process. It took probably half an hour, 45 minutes to make its way down the front of the body. And I immediately knew what might be happening because I was very familiar with the tradition now. And it met with various resistances in different parts of the body. It wasn't a, just a clean ride. There were various parts of the body, like the throat and the chest and the, the stomach, where it seemed like the body was fighting against this energy that was coming down. Um, but it did make its way down to the, the base of the body. And then it turned around at the base of the body and started to make its way up the spine. And it was, it was a strange, it was kind of pleasant and unpleasant at the same time. It was pleasant because it's this blissful energy, but it was also unpleasant because I was resisting it as well. There was a, the body was resisting this, what seemed like this invasion of some kind. And this energetic current, that's the best way I can describe it, started to move up the spine. And again, huge resistance at different parts of the spine. One or two places where I thought that's it, it, it stopped, it's not gonna go any further. And uh, that this current continued to move up the top of the spine and eventually hit the top of the head where it had started. So it seemed to form some kind of circle. And that, once the circle was complete, I was plunged into this feeling of uh, bliss. I can only describe it as the feeling you get when you're having, it's a freezing cold day and you go and have a really beautiful warm shower. It's like the body thaws. Y your body had been really tight because of the cold weather. And you go and stand in a really beautiful warm shower and gradually that that thawing process initially it's painful like when your hands are frozen and you put them in hot water it's really painful at first but eventually once the resistance to that thawing process is complete it's blissful and it felt like that bliss and i was in that state and i just lied there for about two hours until it was time to have dinner but I lied there for about two hours just in this blissful state and that was what I look back on as, as a kind of kundalini awakening what's interesting is that about two or three days later I came down with what high fever and my temperature went up to 104 which is actually medically that's actually quite dangerous um and it was obvious that this was i'd never had this before it was obvious this was connected in some way to this strange experience of this circle i'd had about two or three days earlier and at one point the body was so hot and the fever was so intense and i was shaking with the heat of this fever that my wife actually made me sit in a bathtub filled with ice just to cool down the body because the body was so burning up with this what I now call Shakti fever. It's the fever of the Shakti when it starts to burn up the body. Um, and the after effects of that Shakti fever lasted about four months. And there was a period when I wasn't able to go back to work for a few weeks, because when I filled in my sickness report to work, I, I had to just put something like viral infection 
I don't think anyone was at work was going to understand Shakti fever. So I just put like it's a viral infection. And I was off work for a few weeks with this post Kundalini syndrome. That's how maybe people would now describe it. But what I got in the longer term from this was a clear unification of the body mind. What in spiral dynamics we call turquoise seemed to be very operating in me after this Kundalini awakening of the circle, which means that the body and the mind seemed to no longer be in opposition to one another. And I could feel the mind filling up the body. I could feel thoughts as energy currents in the body before they crystallized into concepts in my mind. Um, so the, the mind became embodied. It was like an embodied mind experience. And I also, over the following years, I seemed to awaken to various gifts or skills that I'd never had before. So I found I was able to write in a way that I couldn't write before. And I was able to write like a 400 page novel in like two or three weeks, um, which I could never have done before. So I think again, this experience, maybe this Kundalini Shakti was also uh, awakening certain abilities like, like um, and this is a common experience. There's nothing special here. Uh, this is a commonly reported experience. Uh, certain gifts and abilities, which perhaps had not been very obvious beforehand. Um, and more and more, the sense of self shifted from this unified body mind to this circle. This, this current, this circle actually became who I am. Who I, uh, and the body mind became more of something outside of me. Um, the Kundalini Shakti became more my locus of identity. And not, not all the time, not 24 seven, but on and off over the subsequent years, that became where I, I was centered. So that was the, my Kundalini experience, which relates, I think, to those arrows one and two that I showed in my model on the form light side of the equation. And that was taking place in my early 30s, sort of late 90s, early noughties, that was taking place. How is it progressing now? Um, it's still there in the background. It's not as intense as it was in those early years. It feels like to a large extent, it's done its work to a large extent. So it doesn't have to burn up the same level of resistance that I had in those early years. A lot of that resistance has been dealt with. But if I go into meditation, because I still practice all these practices, if I go into meditation or pranayama or Taoist energy work, that current is very quickly comes into awareness. Um, and it's always implicit in the background, even as I'm going about my day to day work. Yeah. But it, it doesn't have that same intensity. And I don't think it needs to have that same intensity as was there 20 years ago. And would you use the word Kundalini and consciousness interchangeably? Or is it different for you? No, I would use the word consciousness well, it depends which aspect of Kundalini we're talking about, because if you uh, recall the circle model, there are these five different ways that the Kundalini can manifest around the body mind. So types one and two, which is the circle within form and light, I would say that's not consciousness. That is taking place within the manifest world of time and change. But when that Kundalini when we have that type number three, it falls into the right side of the heart. That's when Kundalini meets consciousness. The right side of the heart, the um, Amrita Nadi, the Hridaya Granthi, that's where the Kundalini that was previously in form now meets and co-joins with consciousness at the right side of the heart. That's where in Hindu language, the Shakti, which was initially independent of Shiva, now meets and finds Shiva, which is consciousness on the right side of the heart. And then of course, arrow number four, Shiva and Shakti unite and Kundalini consciousness and form all become one in the arrow number four. 
So whether consciousness and Kundalini are interchangeable depends on which part of the Kundalini process we're actually talking about. Yeah. To tie it all back, all of this together, Nish, how would you um, describe, like how is this reflected in some of the worldviews we have? Um, how, how is the move, movement of Kundalini a kind of like mirrors different worldviews yeah so um that's actually yeah really interesting and that'll be a great way to tie it up so what i'll do actually if i can share the screen again if that's okay sure So if I go back to just that basic circle model, um, what we have here are the five basic constituents of the entire circle of the body mind. The gross, which are the lower chakras, the subtle, which are the middle chakras, the causal, which are the higher chakras, and consciousness, which is the right side of the heart, and conscious light, which is the Amrita Nadi that joins the right side of the heart to the crown chakra. Now, my suggestion here is that each of these aspects of the circle, we've got five aspects, gross, subtle, causal, consciousness, conscious light. Each of these five aspects of the circle if energy and attention is focused or contracted on any one of these five, we will actually end up generating a particular view of the world. So I'll run through these very quickly. If we are centered on the gross, our worldview is probably going to be just materialism, empiricism, science, hedonism, because all we're going to see is the material world, which we are going to see through our senses, we'll examine that with science. And since we don't see anything else, our approach to life is probably going to be just have fun, make the best of it before you die, hedonism. When we awaken to the subtle, and if we now focus our attention and energy purely on the subtle, a very common worldview that may come out of this is what we could call theism which is the traditional religion. This is where there is a God and the God has created the world. So we have God or the different gods, depending which religion we're following in the subtle realm. And that, those, and that God or the different gods, which are really archetypes coming down from the collective consciousness. That's what God and the gods really are. But we don't see that at this stage. We see these as gods or higher beings and so our worldview, one worldview that could come out of this focusing on the subtle realm could be theism, which is what you see in the Abrahamic religions of, say, Judaism, Christianity, Islam, where there's a God, there's a world, and our job is to obey this God and to get some kind of salvation from this God so that when we die, we go to this good place in the subtle realm. So that's what the worldview could be if we're focused on the subtle realm. Traditional religion, God, the world, salvation. If we now focus on the causal realm, if, we, if our energy and attention is focused on the causal realm, one kind of worldview that could emerge out of this focus is what we could call emanationism. So this is where we will now be focused and absorbed in the ground of all being and what we will see is that the world comes out of the ground of all being through involution and then the world goes back into the ground of all being through evolution so if we're focused on the causal realm we're going to see the world in terms of this circle descent and ascent the circle of kundalini and examples of that are evolution neoplatonism aurobindo these are the kind of uh, worldviews that could emerge from causal, where it's all about evolution within form. If our focus is on consciousness, which is now to the left of the diagram, what, we, what we're now doing is we're realizing consciousness as apart from form. And the worldview that 
could arise here is what we see in many of the higher Eastern traditions. So this is where we see consciousness as real form as lower in some, as in some way. And the purpose of existence is now to realize consciousness as different from form. So we see this in Jainism, for example. In Jainism, we have Purusha and Prakriti. Purusha is consciousness, Prakriti is, is the causal. And our job is to disentangle Purusha from Prakriti and to realize consciousness independent from form. And that's what makes us into, uh, into one of these uh, great realizers like Mahavira, for example. We see this in Buddhism. The form and light is the circle, that circle in the body, that's the realm or the process of birth and death. And our job is to get out of there so we don't reincarnate and to situate ourselves on, in consciousness on the left, to realize the unborn so we don't ever have to go back into form again. That's another form of this consciousness only worldview. And the third form of it is Vedanta. We realize our true self, which is on the left-hand side, the consciousness. And that alone is what is true. Form on the right side is Maya. That we want to get rid of that. It's illusion in some way. We want to realize consciousness on the, on the left there. So those are our four main worldviews here. Gross materialism, subtle theism, God and the world, causal, emanationism, ascent and descent, consciousness, which is this kind of transcendental unborn self, which we want to realize. And these are four very distinct worldviews that you find out in the world, and they all strongly disagree with each other. And the reason they disagree with each other, I mean, they're all correct at their own level, but the reason they disagree with each other is because each of them is focused or grounded in a different part of this circle model in a different part of reality, in a different part of the body. And there is a fifth point of view, a fifth worldview, which is not really a worldview at all, because it's simply final realization, which is conscious light. And here, there's no longer any focusing on any part of the circle anymore, because every contraction has been released into this prior blissful conscious light. And here, the point of view here is, which is not really a point of view, is that everything that arises is simply a modification or a manifestation of this conscious light. And you find that in the highest traditions, Shaiva Tantra, you find it in Dzogchen in, in, in Tibetan Buddhism, you find it in esoteric Taoism in China, you find it in the teachings of Adi Da, who was an American teacher. So we've got these five points of view. And if we look now at the Kundalini chakras, basically those lower chakras, root, sacral, solar plexus, that would be the more of the materialistic view. The solar plexus, heart, throat, that would be more of the religious theistic view. The heart, subtle heart is about love, it's about loving God. And the, the third eye, the crown, that would be more the emanationist point of view descent and ascent. The crown is the ground of all being. The causal heart to the right, the left of the diagram, the right of the body, that would be the consciousness schools, Jainism, Buddhism, Vedanta. And then finally, when the causal heart returns to the crown, and we realize that non-duality of conscious light, that would be the final tantric conscious light point of view. So here you have basically, you know, uh, the gross one would be, we could think of that also as the subtle school, which is theistic. Two would be the ascending school, which is emanationist. Three would be the Jain Buddhist Vedantic school. Four would be, and five would be that final radically non-dual tantric school where it all comes together and everything is just that conscious light, which is the whole, the whole of the circle. So that's, I think, how this Kundalini model um, shows us why different people have different views, because they're focusing on different chakras and different movements of the Kundalini around the body-mind, 
and the body mind itself is a microcosm of this circle, which is the whole of the cosmos. So that's how I would see different views arising from different forms of self contraction around the body mind. So the body mind, all, all of our views can actually be said to be generated by different parts of the body mind. And that's why we are having different views, because different parts of the body mind are speaking differently. That makes a lot of sense. Uh, I think it also eases up that um, if someone is new, if there's confusion about like all these contradictions going on between different uh, teachers, different traditions, um, it makes sense now. Like, uh, yeah. Yeah. And so, it, so it's not a question of he's right and he's wrong. Everybody's right. They're just focused on different parts of the circle. And it's yeah. different parts of the circle that are speaking different things because different parts of the circle are seeing different things. If you're in a room and you've got five different cameras in five different places around the room, they're gonna take five quite different photographs. Now, all of those photographs are right from that angle. And this is how we have to see it, I think. The body mind is your room and the chakras are the different cameras. And so each part of the body mind is seeing reality from a different angle. And we're getting different photographs. And rather stupidly, we're arguing with each other that my photo is right and yours is wrong, but they're all right, because there's only the one room, which is your body, which is a microcosm of the universe, which is the big room. So that's, uh, that's the way that I would have to see that. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And that also, um uh, encourages one to not to dismiss your own observation in case it doesn't match with um anybody and like some of these other speakers or teachers yeah, uh, because exactly. they, yeah you may be seeing something new or different the, the the way the way i see it is everybody's right um but we all have a piece of the truth we're all partially right None of us are completely right, but we're all partially right. And our job as we grow and evolve is to see how those different puzzles, those different pieces of the puzzle fit together. So we go beyond this tribalistic provincialism where we take sides. The great reason to see reality as a circle is a circle doesn't have any sides. And we don't need to take sides in this. We're all right, partially right in different parts of reality thank you so much nish this was a very very um um like it, it this talk has been almost kind of like a revelation thank you so much thank I, you. I, and i feel like this is this was a beautiful way to sum up everything we discussed today <laughs> um, yes. it, it makes it gives like a broader view for um how this applies um on a worldly level so thank you so much you're very welcome suma thank you very much uh, it's yeah it's been it's been a great second discussion and i'm looking forward to our third discussion so mm -hmm. that that would be even more i feel like um even more broader um mm -hmm. to cover like we, we we would be discussing abrahamic traditions so mm -hmm. that's a whole new way of uh, looking at things so i'm very much looking forward to that Yes, me too. I'm looking forward to that too. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I want to thank the audience. Um, in case they want to connect with you, they can just go to the, your website, integraldream.com. Correct. Yes, integraldream.com, which has all of my books and videos and talks and conferences and so on. And there's also a way on there to contact me if anyone wants to seriously pursue any of this. And yeah, I'll thanks to everyone and i'll see you soon see you soon thank you so much yes. bye bye